Hello, you're watching RT with me, Kevin Owen. We're very pleased to say today that uh, we're joined by the President of the Russian Federation, Vladimir Putin. We're very pleased because this is his uh, first major interview since his inauguration, and uh, he's granted it to us. So, uh, Mr. President, thank you very much for, for making the time to talk to us. What I want to talk about, first of all, is the uh, ongoing, at the moment, APEC summit. You'll be going there very shortly in uh, Vladivostok. Of course, it's the... Uh, uh, first time that Russia has held it, a uh, prestigious event. But it always begs the question, what's actually achieved at these events, events like that, like the G8, like the G20? Now, although APEC is primarily uh, an, an economic vessel, um, there's a lot of politics involved as well. And, of course, a lot of the key players, uh, including you, including uh, America, a lot of uh, key players disagree uh, on some very key issues. I'm thinking about Syria, I'm thinking about missile defence, thinking about Iran. Is there a danger that the politics may stifle, get in the way of the big economic deals that the very same key players, that is true, but in fact, and you've just said it to yourself, APEC was originally conceived as a forum for discussing economic issues. And as this year's host country, we also intend to focus on economic and socio-economic challenges. APEC was originally established with the overall objective of liberalizing the global economy, and we intend to make this the key issue on the agenda in Vladivostok. When I invited our counterparts five years ago to meet in the Russian Federation, my rationale was to acknowledge the importance of this area for Russia, given that two-thirds of Russia's territory is located in Asia, and yet the bulk of our foreign trade more than 50% is with Europe, whereas Asia only accounts for 24%. Meanwhile, Asia is developing rapidly and intensively. You and I know it, and everybody knows it. Therefore, we are planning to focus primarily on economic challenges, transport, global food security, and the task of liberalizing the global economy. It's a well-known fact that the past year has seen a dramatic increase in the number of people affected by starvation, which has grown by 200 million. This means that 1 billion people worldwide are currently suffering from food shortages or famine. I believe this is the kind of issue that will be the focus of attention, along with a number of other challenges that are highly sensitive and significant for millions of people. As far as Syria and other hotspots are concerned, issues that are currently in the limelight, we will certainly address them in our deliberations at the forum, in bilateral discussions or otherwise. They won't be overlooked. Do you think there should be more practical outcomes, though? Is it, is it too much of a talking shop, of events like APEC? You know, I attended the G20 meeting in Mexico just recently. As a rule, such meetings are pre-arranged and pre-discussed by our aides and ministers and high-ranking experts. And still there are certain issues that eventually come into focus for the heads of state attending. That's how it was in Mexico. I was very interested to follow the discussions and look at conflicting opinions, and I participated in some of those discussions. I think the coming forum will see just as many debates, but it's only through this kind of meticulous hard work, year after year and quarter after quarter, if not day by day, if you excuse my official ease, that we can eventually arrive at acceptable solutions to sensitive issues such as, say, liberalizing trade, because this is an issue that affects millions of people. You know the issues debated within the framework of the World Trade Organization and the coming APEC summit are so immensely important for us, partly because Russia is now a full member of the WTO. We have also established a customs union and a common economic space in the post-Soviet territory, jointly with Belarus and Kazakhstan. Dialogue is very important for us so that we can explain to our partners and help them realize how this kind of association in the post-Soviet area could be beneficial and helpful, especially since the vehicles I've mentioned have been established based on WTO principles. Okay, thanks for explaining that. We're going to come back to APEC a little bit later, if we may. But you touched on uh, another big subject in the headlines, the horrendous events that have been unfolding in Syria over the last 18 months. Now, uh, Russia's uh, position has been uh, steadfast all the way along the line here. You've said there should be no foreign intervention and, uh, the, and it should be the Syrian people who do the deciding and it should be done through diplomacy. However, that's a great idea, but day in, day out, innocent lives are being lost on both sides. Is it time for something more than talking? Should Russia be reassessing its position maybe now? 
How come Russia is the only one which is expected to revise its stance? Don't you think our counterparts in negotiations ought to revise theirs as well? Because if we look back at the events in the past few years, we'll see that quite a few of our counterparts' initiatives have not played out the way they were intended to. Take the examples of numerous countries riven by escalating internal conflict. The US and its allies went into Afghanistan, and now they're all thinking about how they can get out of there. If there's anything on the table, it's the issue of assisting them in withdrawing their troops and hardware from Afghanistan through our transit routes. Now, are you sure the situation there will be stable for decades to come? So far, no one can be confident about it. And look at what's going on in Arab countries. There have been notable developments in Egypt, Libya, Tunisia, Yemen and other places. Would you say that order and prosperity have been totally ensured for these nations? And what's going on in Iraq? In Libya, there are armed clashes still raging among the country's various tribes. I won't even mention the way the country had its regime changed. This is a separate topic. What concerns us, and what I want to emphasize once again, is the current hostilities in Syria. But at the same time, we are just as concerned about the possible consequences of certain decisions should they be taken. In our opinion, the most important task today is ending the violence. We must urge all the warring parties, including the government and the so-called rebels, the armed opposition, to sit down at the negotiating table and decide on a future that would guarantee security for all stakeholders in Syria. Only then should they get down to any practical measures regarding the country's future government system. We realize that this country needs a change, but this doesn't mean that change should come with bloodshed. Okay, well given the facts uh, regarding Syria that you see on the table now, what is the next step there? What do you realistically think is going to happen next? We told our partners we would like to sit down together at the negotiating table in Geneva, and when we did, together we charted a roadmap for further action that could help bring peace to Syria and channel developments down a more constructive path. We received almost unanimous support and shared the talks results with the Syrian government. But then the rebels actually refused to recognize those decisions, and many of the negotiating parties have also quietly backed down. I believe that the first thing to do is to stop shipping arms into the war zone, which is still going on. We should stop trying to impose unacceptable solutions on either side, because it is a dead end. That's what we should do. It's that simple. Luckily, we generally enjoy friendly relations with the Arab world, but we would like to stay away from Islamic sectarian conflict or interfere in a showdown involving the Sunnis, the Shia, the Alawis and so on. We treat everyone with equal respect. We also get on well with Saudi Arabia and other countries. I have cultivated a warm personal relationship with the custodian of two Islamic shrines. The only underlying motive behind our stance is the desire to create a favorable environment for the situation to develop positively in years to come. What are your thoughts about the United Nations and the way the United Nations has reacted, particularly in Syria? There's been criticism that um, it's, a fa it's, it's, it's failed to <coughs> deliver a, a unified front, if you like, and it's become more of a figurehead organization. Do you share that view? Quite the contrary, I would say. My take on the issue is the absolute opposite of what you've just said. If the United Nations and the Security Council had indeed turned into a mere rubber stamping tool for any one of the member states, it would have ceased to exist, just like the League of Nations did. But the reality is that the Security Council and the UN are meant to be a tool for compromise. Seeking to achieve it is a long and complex process, but only hard work can yield us fruit. Understood. Mr. President, another question I'd like to ask you. Um, a number of Western and Arab nations have been covertly, to start with, um, supporting the FSA, the Free Syrian Army. And indeed, some of them are doing it openly now. <coughs> of course, the catch here is that the FSA is suspected of um, hiring in known al-Qaeda fighters amongst their ranks. So the twist in this tale is that a lot of those countries are actually sponsoring uh, terrorism, if you like, in Syria. Countries that have suffered from terrible terrorism themselves. Is that a fair assessment? You know, when someone aspires to attain an end they see as optimal, any means will do. As a rule, they will try and do that by hook or by crook, and hardly ever think of the consequences. 
That was the case during the war in Afghanistan, when the Soviet Union invaded in 1979. At that time, our present partners supported a rebel movement there and basically gave rise to al-Qaeda, which later backfired on the United States itself. Today, some want to use militants from al-Qaeda or some other organizations with equally radical views to accomplish their goals in Syria. This policy is dangerous and very short-sighted. In that case, one should unlock Guantanamo, arm all of its inmates and bring them to Syria to do the fighting. They're practically the same kind of people. But what we should bear in mind is that one day these people would get back at their former captors. On the other hand, these same people should bear in mind that they will eventually end up in a new prison, very much like the one off the Cuban shore. I would like to emphasize that this policy is very short-sighted and is fraught with dire consequences. I'd like to broaden it out a little bit now, uh, a little bit wider from Syria. You touched on it yourself, sir. Um, Syria is in the middle of a civil war. We've seen conflicts in Bahrain and in Saudi Arabia. Okay, things are a bit calmer in Egypt, uh, uh, Libya and Tunisia. You mentioned it just now. But standing back from it overall, all the troubles we've seen in the Middle East, uh, all the turmoil there, uh, has it been at all for the good or for the bad? Where's it, where's it put that region now? Uh, you know, we can discuss this into the small hours and still run out of time. For me, it's clear these events have a historic logic. The leaders of these countries have obviously overlooked the need for change and missed ongoing trends at home and abroad. So they failed to produce the reforms which would have saved the day. All these events logically stem from this background. Whether this is a blessing or a curse, with many negative implications, is now too early to say. In any case, the lack of a civilized approach, the high level of violence, has so far stood in the way of any sustainable political structures which would help solve economic and social problems in societies hit by those events. This is what causes a lot of concern for the future, because the people in those countries, who have had enough of their previous regimes, clearly expect the new governments to begin with tackling their social and economic problems in a competent way. But with no political stability, these problems cannot be solved. Let's turn now to the United States, the upcoming election there, which we're all looking forward to very much. Of course, now the reset button with uh, Russia was, was firmly pushed by uh, Barack Obama over the last four years, but it's had its ups and downs, and there's still that missile defense shield uh, that's a, a headache for Russia in, uh, in the east of Europe. If Obama does win a second term, what's going to define the next chapter of Russia and America's relations? And is it a chapter that you can do business with? I believe that over the last four years, Presidents Obama and Medvedev have made a lot of progress in strengthening Russia-U.S. relations. We have signed the New START Treaty, and backed by the U.S., Russia has become a fully-fledged member of the World Trade Organization. There are more reasons to be optimistic about our bilateral relations, our strengthened cooperation in combating terrorism and organized crime, in the non-proliferation of weapons of mass destruction and in other areas. In other words, we have accumulated quite a lot of positive experience. But the issue you mentioned, the U.S. missile defense system, is surely one of the key issues on today's agenda because it involves Russia's vital interests. Scholars and experts understand that a unilateral solution will not enhance global stability. In essence, the intention is to upset the strategic balance, which is a very dangerous thing to do, as any involved party will always strive to maintain its defensive capabilities, and the entire thing could simply trigger off an arms race. Is it possible to find a solution to the problem if President Obama is re-elected for a second term? In principle, yes it is. But this isn't just about President Obama. For all I know, his desire to work out a solution is quite sincere. I met him recently on the sidelines of the G20 summit in Los Cabos, Mexico, where we had a chance to talk. And though we talked mostly about Syria, I had the chance to feel the mood of my counterpart. Part. My feeling is that he is a sincere man and that he sincerely wants to implement positive change. But can he do it? Will they let him do it? I mean that there is also the military lobby and the Department of State, which is quite conservative. By the way, it is fairly similar to Russia's foreign ministry. They are run by a number of professional plans who have been working there for decades. The thing is that in order to solve the missile defense issue, we both need to accept as an axiom 
that yes, we are reliable partners and allies for each other. Let's imagine for a second we have a solution that means from now on we jointly assess missile threats and control this defence system together. This is a highly sensitive area of national defence. I am not sure that our partners are ready for this kind of cooperation. Is there anything that Russia can do to, to try and, 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 and meet in the middle to give a better ground? We did what we could. We said, let's do it together. Our partners are so far refusing to go along, but what else can we do? We can maintain dialogue. That's exactly what we will be doing. But naturally, as our American partners proceed with developing their own missile defense, we shall have to think how we can defend ourselves and preserve the strategic balance. By the way, America's European allies, who also happen to be Russia's partners, have nothing to do with it. I believe that as a European national, you should understand it. This is a purely American missile defense system and a strategic one at that, with its European elements pushed to the periphery. You see, Europe, just like Russia, is not allowed to take part in either assessing missile threats or controlling the system. Our original proposal was to develop it as a three-party solution, but our partners have not agreed to that. Okay, so um, we think you can work with, uh, with, with Barack Obama if he gets in. What about if Mitt Romney gets in? I've got some quotes here um, from just a month or two ago. Um, this is the man that, if he makes it to the White House, said, uh, Russia is without question our number one geopolitical foe. They fight every cause for the world's worst actors. He went on to say, uh, Russia is not a friendly character on the world stage. Could you work with him, sir? Smotion. Yes, we can. We'll work with whichever president is elected by the American people. But our effort will only be as efficient as our partners allow it to be. As for Mr. Romney's position, we understand that this is to a certain extent motivated by election campaign rhetoric. But I also think that he was obviously wrong, because such behavior in the international arena is the same as using nationalism and segregation as tools of US domestic policy. Its effect in the international arena is the same. When a politician, a person who aspires to lead a nation, especially a great country like the US, declares someone to be enemy a priori. And by the way, this brings something else to mind. When we talk about the missile defense system, our American partners keep telling us this is not directed against you. But what happens if Mr. Romney, who believes us to be America's number one foe, is elected as president of the United States? In that case, the missile defense system will definitely be directed against Russia, as it is technologically configured exactly for this purpose. And you also have to think about its strategic character. It's built not for a year or even a decade, and the chances that a man with Romney's views could come to power are quite high. So what are we supposed to do to ensure our security? I'd like to talk about the latest developments in the uh, Magnitsky case for a moment now. Uh, both the US and Britain, Britain most recently, are working on this list of high-ranking uh, Russian officials, Russian citizens that they say are responsible for his death. Uh, he was a, a, a high-ranking finance lawyer who died in a, in a, a Russian jail, to explain to our viewers. Um, why is there still such a perception abroad that justice wasn't dealt here in Russia, that the people responsible for it hadn't been dealt with properly? Why does this keep rumbling on? You see, there are people who need an enemy. They are looking for an opponent to fight against. Do you know how many people die while in prison in those countries which have condemned Russia? The numbers are huge. Look at the US that came up with the so-called Magnitsky list. As you know, there is no death penalty in Russia, while the US still keeps it on the books. Anyone, including women, can be executed. At the same time, all civilized societies know that judicial errors can occur in capital punishment cases cases, even when people plead guilty. It turns out later on that the convict did not commit the crime. But that's one thing. More importantly, I think, only God has the right to take life away. But I don't want to go too much into that right now. There's a lot of philosophy in it. But with that in mind, we could have come up with our own blacklist, and more than one, of people who use the death penalty in other countries, but we choose not to do it. As for Mr. Magnitsky, it's certainly a great tragedy that he died in prison, and there certainly must be a thorough investigation. 
If someone is found guilty, they must be punished. But what I want to emphasize is that there is absolutely no political context in this case. It is a tragedy, but it is only to do with crime and legal procedure, not politics, no more than that. Still, someone is looking to spoil relations with Russia. They have banned some Russian officials who are allegedly involved in the death of Mr. Magnitsky from entering their country. Of course, I do regret his death and I offer my condolences to his family. But what should Russia do in such cases? Take appropriate steps and similarly list officials of the country that introduces such measures against Russia, like that. And to make it perfectly clear, this case won't be re-examined by Russia. Which case? What needs to be retried? We must only find out whether someone is guilty of his death or not. And if someone's guilty and responsible for the death in some way, that person should be held accountable. That's it. Again, there is no politics behind it. It's the job of the law enforcement professionals to look into it. And of course the Russian authorities are going to do that. The prosecutor's office is working on it now. Okay, and I'd like to uh, talk about the uh, trial and jailing of uh, Pussy Riot, that uh, punk group band. There's been much criticism that the sentence handed down was too strong, was too much, and, and the, the, the whole case was just made too, too, too big a deal of. In fact, it actually backfired and it's brought more people to their cause with the publicity. With hindsight, so it was a beautiful thing, but with hindsight, do you think uh, that the case could have been handled differently? Could you please translate the name of the band into Russian? Pussy Riot, the punk band. I don't know what you call them in Russian, sir. So maybe you could tell me. <laughs> Can you translate the first word into Russian? Or maybe it would sound too obscene. Yes, I think you wouldn't do it because it sounds too obscene, even in English. I actually thought it was referring to a cat, but maybe I'm missing a point here. But anyway, sir, do you think that the, that the, that the case was, was handled wrongly in any way? Could some lessons be learned? I know you understand it perfectly well. You don't need to pretend you don't get it. It's just because these people made everyone say their band's name too many times. It's obscene, but forget it. Here's what I would like to say. I have always felt that punishment should be proportionate to the offence. I am not in a position now and would not like in any way to comment on the decision of a Russian court, but I would rather talk about the moral side of the story. First, in case you've never heard of it, a couple of years ago one of the band's members put up three effigies in one of Moscow's big supermarkets, with a sign saying that Jews, gays and migrant workers should be driven out of Moscow. I think the authorities should have looked into their activities back then. After that they staged an orgy in a public place. Of course people are allowed to do whatever they want to do, as long as it's legal. But this kind of conduct in a public place should not go unnoticed by the authorities. Then they uploaded the video of that orgy on the internet. You know, some fans of group sex say it's better than one-on-one, -on -one, because like in any team, you don't need to hit the ball all the time. Again, it's okay to do what you like privately, but I wouldn't be that certain about uploading your acts on the internet. It could be the subject of legal assessment too. Then they turned up at Yelokhova Cathedral here in Moscow, causing unholy mayhem, and then went to another cathedral and caused mayhem there too. You know Russians still have painful memories of the early years of Soviet rule, when thousands of Orthodox, Muslim, as well as the clergy from other religions were persecuted. Soviet authorities brutally repressed the clergy. Many churches were destroyed. The attacks had a devastating effect on all our traditions religions, and so in general I think the state has to protect the feelings of believers. I will not comment on whether the verdict is well grounded and the sentence proportionate to the offence. These girls must have lawyers who defend their interests in court. They have the right to file an appeal and demand a new hearing, but it's up to them. It's just a legal issue. Is it realistic at all you think they will get some sort of early release? I don't know whether their lawyers have filed an appeal or not. I don't follow the case that closely. If they appeal, a higher court is empowered to take any decision. To be honest, I try to stay as far away from the case as possible. I know the details, but I do not want to get into it. 
There's concern here and, uh, and abroad uh, that Russia has been suffering a clampdown on the opposition since, uh, since you returned as president. There's <coughs> tighter defamation law, uh, upping the fines for defamation, internet censorship laws uh, brought in to protect children. Um, all these introduced under your watch. What's the balance between a healthy opposition, you think, and maintaining law and order? What is your view? Yeah. So is it true then that other countries don't have laws that ban child pornography, including online? Indeed they do. So they do. Well, we didn't until recently, and if we began to protect our society and our children from these maybe offenses... It the of the was, uh, maybe it was the timing of the introduction. Um, it may have seemed a bit heavy-handed as you came back to power again. You know, I try not to think about it. I just do what I think is right for this country and for its people. And that's how I will work in the future. Of course, I am aware of how my conduct resonates globally, but this cannot dictate my policies. Any steps that we take are in the interests of the Russian people, and our children need this kind of protection. No one is going to use this as a tool to restrict the internet or online freedoms, but we have the right to protect our children. You might also recall the mass riots that shocked the UK a year ago. A lot of people were injured and a lot of property was damaged. Is it better to let things deteriorate to that state and then spend a year tracking down people and locking them up? I think it's best not to let things get that far. That's my first point. Now to my second point. Let me now get down to the hard facts. You must know that a year ago I backed reform that would see Russian governors elected and not appointed as previously through secret ballot. But I also took the next step. After taking office, I introduced a new bill on elections to the upper chamber of the Russian parliament. These specific steps will pave the way for a more democratic Russia. And it's true both for its people and its state. There have been other proposals initiated too, including changes in the lawmaking process. The State Duma is now considering using public initiatives on major national issues submitted via the internet as a source of new legislation. If a draft bill is supported by 100,000 web votes, it will then be discussed in the State Duma. Right now we are looking into how to put this idea into practice. There are other major proposals as well. We seek to make our society more advanced and more democratic, and we intend to be consistent in following this path. We started off uh, our talk by talking about the, the forthcoming APEC summit, which you're off to very shortly. And when you're there, I gather you'll be meeting with Chinese President Hu Jintao. You won't be meeting Barack Obama because he's not there. Hillary Clinton will be. He's not there. Is that a sign of how he regards APEC? It may just be busy, but uh, is it a sign that how he regards it? And is it also a sign that maybe uh, China is increasingly becoming a, a bigger geopolitical and, uh, and, and commercial partner for you? China is indeed becoming a global economic and political hub. This is part of a global trend, with new centers emerging on the political and economic landscape. This is an obvious fact for everyone. The question is the pace of change. China has taken up this new leading role, not only in Russia's eyes, but also in the eyes of the whole world. What makes us rather special, however, is that Russia and China are neighbors, and our special relations took thousands of years to evolve to where they are now. We have been through times of sunshine, which were very beneficial for both countries. We have also been through periods of gloom and conflict. At the moment, Russia-China relations are at an unprecedented high, and we share mutual trust both politically and economically. Over the coming years, we are bound to achieve a $100 billion turnover rate. To put this in perspective, currently Europe makes up 51% of Russia's foreign trade, which amounts to over $200 billion. That will be a serious push forward. Our American partners told us long ago that Barack Obama would not attend summit. The reason is the election race in the US, and we think it's okay. The US will still be represented at a high level. So yes, we've known for several months now, and we fully understand the reasons. Anyway, this will be a great summit, with top officials coming from 20 countries, heads of state and heads of government. Of course, it's a pity the US president cannot come at this time, but nothing can be done about it. I think if he really had the opportunity, he would not miss it, because it's a good event for the US to talk not only with us, but also with other Asia-Pacific partners. 
Anyway, I met Barack Obama earlier in Mexico, as I said, and had a chance to discuss our bilateral ties and exchange opinions on the major global issues. So we do continue our dialogue. Domestically, again, uh, I'd like to talk now about corruption. It's a word that comes up time and time again here in Russia. You've talked about it before, but, my, but most notably, um, <coughs> the, the, the previous president was, was really putting it top of his uh, list of things to sort out. However, when Dmitry Medvedev uh, left office as president, he reported only modest, modest success at tackling it. How serious a problem do you think corruption is in Russia in 2012? And what are you going to do about it? Corruption is a problem for any country, and you'll find it everywhere, be it in Europe or the United States. They have legalized many things. Let's take the private corporate lobby. What is it? Is it corruption or not? It's legalized, and so formally it's okay, within the law. But that depends on how you look at it. Therefore, I will repeat that this problem is an issue for many countries. More important is the level and scope of corruption. In our case, it's quite high. But this is typical of transition economies. The reason is that while new economic models are evolving, many things are not yet adjusted or aligned, and the state is not always in control. There are also value issues, especially when we move from a socialist mindset and planned economy values to eternal values. This is a complicated process, especially if the new market facilitates rapid wealth acquisition for some particular circles or groups of people. This is something that is perceived painfully as reprehensible. The average person then starts thinking, if it's okay for those people to earn billions in a couple of years, why isn't it okay for me to do this or that? even if it isn't exactly in sync with the law and moral values. All this undermines the very foundation of the campaign against corruption. This is a very difficult process. But undoubtedly, this is an essential part of our agenda, and we shall continue our efforts in this area. There are a big list of causes there that you cited. Where do you begin to go about tackling it then? When, does the, when is there some sort of sea change? When are you hoping for some... Uh, when it's going to get better, if you like? What we need to start with is to make our entire society detest the very notion of corruption. Corruption is a two-way process, with two sides to it, the bribe giver and the bribe taker. And it often happens that the bribe givers are more active than the bribe takers. Therefore, it is a matter of supporting moral values. It is also a matter of making our law enforcement agencies more efficient and developing a legal framework that minimizes opportunities for corruption. This is a multi-dimensional task, very sensitive and difficult, and we shall work on every aspect of it. Well, one of the practical ways that you're going about it is this new draft law to prevent government officials from having bank accounts and, uh, and, and property abroad. I don't know what you think about that law, but it does beg the question, uh, isn't it possible for somebody to use somebody else's bank account? How are you going to enforce it? Of course you could. This bill has not been passed yet. It's being reviewed by the State Duma. This naturally implies certain limitations for officials, because current legislation allows any Russian citizen to have a foreign bank account or property. Yet limitations may be introduced for some officials, especially at a high level. I don't see anything extraordinary about this, especially in view of today's reality. But the State Duma will have to present the rationale for their proposal and develop it into a detailed draft law. Overall, I believe this law has value and would assist the fight against corruption to a certain extent. Of course it will, because those people who are willing to commit themselves to serving their country and their people should be willing to agree to such terms that if they want to have a bank account, it'll have to be a Russian bank account or a Russian branch of a bank. Why not? Many overseas banks have branches in Russia. One can keep their accounts here. Why go to Austria or the United States to open an account? If you connect your fate to this country, be so kind as to make public your interests here, including financial interests. Do not hide your money anywhere.
While uh, we've got you with us, uh, I'd like to get your thoughts on the ongoing Julian Assange case in Britain. I'm sure you've been watching it, his uh, legal battle um, with Britain and uh, um, with a number of other countries as well, but equally his attempts uh, to, to get asylum in Ecuador, which he's now got, he's holed up in the Ecuadorian embassy. What's your opinion, though, about Britain's stance? <coughs> At one point it was talking about um, uh, revoking the embassy's uh, diplomatic immunities so that they could actually go in and get him. That kind of sounds a bit odd when, of course, you think as well that uh, Russia has a number of suspects that Russia wants to talk to in Britain. It's a kind of topsy-turvy situation, isn't it? But they're given safe harbour in Britain. This certainly is an unsettling factor in our relations with the UK. I used to tell my previous counterparts and friends in the British government, not those holding office at the moment, that Britain happens to be harbouring certain individuals who have blood on their hands, having waged a real war on Russian territory and slaughtered people. I told them just imagine what it would be like if Russia were to harbour militants from, say, the Irish Republican Army, not those negotiating and pursuing a compromise with the government these days, those are perfectly sane and sensible people, but those with a radical agenda. You know what I was told in response? But that's exactly what the Soviet Union used to do, aiding people like that. First of all, I'm a former Soviet Secret Service operative myself. I don't know whether the USSR used to aid this sort of people or not, simply because I never had anything to do with it. But even if we assume it did, that was back in the Cold War era. There has been a cardinal change in the settings. The Soviet Union is history, and what we have today is a new Russia. How can we allow ourselves to be dominated by our old phobias and outdated perceptions of international relations and the kind of relations between our nations? It's time to let them go. We are constantly lectured about how independent Britain's judiciary is. It makes its own decisions, and no one can influence it. But what about Julian Assange? They have ruled him to be extradited. What is that if it's not a self-evident example of a double standard? I won't make a definitive statement, but as far as I know, Ecuador has requested guarantees from the Swedish government that Sweden wouldn't hand Assange over to the United States. No guarantees have been forthcoming. At the very least, this suggests that we are looking at a politically motivated trial. OK, we'll be following the developments there. And we talked about some of the problems that uh, Russia faces. One of the long-term uh, problems that Russia's uh, been facing is the, the drugs trade, the import of drugs from Afghanistan. It's increased many-fold since uh, NATO went in there over a decade ago. NATO troops are due out in 2014. What then? Uh, does Russia have any hope that you can curb this huge drugs problem? <sighs> So far, it's not being solved. We are constantly engaged in dialogue with our partners, including those nations who have troops deployed in Afghanistan. Yet the situation has not improved. Instead, it's deteriorated. The amount of drugs produced in Afghanistan has increased by 60% in the past year. By the way, I'm not sure about the exact figures, but some 90% of heroin peddled in the UK comes from Afghanistan. This is a common challenge and a common threat for us all. For Russia, this is a very serious threat to our national security that cannot be overstated. More than 20% of the overall drug traffic coming from Afghanistan is marketed inside Russia. That equates to 70 tonnes of heroin and roughly 56 tonnes of crude opium as of last year, which is an immense amount, and it definitely qualifies as a threat to our national security. Can you explain to our viewers uh, what the correlation was? Why did this problem uh, increase while NATO troops were there? Was there any connection? What was, what, why was that happening? There is an apparent link. I won't bring up any criminal schemes right now, but none of the nations who are currently committing their troops to Afghanistan want to make matters worse for themselves by combating drugs in Afghanistan, because drugs are Afghanistan's way of making a living. 9% of that country's GDP comes from drug trafficking. If you want to replace this 9%, you'll have to pay, but no one wants to. And you cannot get anywhere with mere statements about how you are planning to make up for those drug revenues with other kinds of income. Talk is not enough. What you need is substantive economic policies and financial assistance. Nobody seems willing to provide that, 
and no one wants to complicate matters for themselves by taking on drug trafficking, because if you take away drug revenues from these people, you effectively compel them to starvation, and that means making even more enemies in Afghanistan. If you go after drugs, people will go after you. That's all there is to it. Drugs are closely related to terrorism and organized crime, but that is something everybody is aware of already. Everyone knows that drug revenues are partly used to finance terrorism. But even this awareness and the realization that Europe is being flooded with Afghan-produced drugs is not enough to encourage our partners to seriously tackle this issue. And this is very sad. A final thought from you, Mr. President. Uh, while you'll be talking money and finances uh, at the uh, forthcoming APEC summit that you're going to, um, looking at the <coughs> world economy from where you are generally, do you think we're heading for a, a second global slump? And if we do, if we do, is, is Russia as well prepared uh, to, to bat it off as it did last time? It did pretty well last time, but is it as well prepared this time? I believe we are even better prepared because we've already experienced the first wave of the crisis and we have an understanding of what's to be done about it and how we should do it. And we have the instruments for crisis management. Moreover, I tasked Russia's previous cabinet as early as last year with upgrading the already tried and tested instruments, drafting new laws and adjusting our regulations. We asked Parliament to assign 200 billion rubles to a government reserve fund, and Parliament agreed. Therefore, we are generally equipped for managing a crisis. On top of that, as you know, we have enjoyed fairly strong economic growth, a rate of 4.2%, which is the highest among the world's largest economies next to China and India. The Eurozone's average growth rate has been 3.9%, while ours was 42 By the way, both the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank are predicting negative growth at minus 0.3% for the Eurozone next year. This year, we are still counting on positive growth ranging between 4 and 5%. That's precisely why, even if Russia should face economic difficulties, it will have plenty of instruments at hand to deal with the challenge. We have reinforced our gold and currency reserves almost bringing them back to pre-crisis levels. We presently rate third worldwide next to China and Japan with upwards of $500 billion in gold and currency reserves. Parallel to that, the government is rebuilding its own reserves. We have two government reserve funds, the $80 billion National Wealth Fund and the Reserve Fund, which is worth roughly $60 billion to finance a budget deficit should we suffer one. But so far we don't have a deficit. Next year's budget registers a surplus, a slight one it may be. Our unemployment rates are the lowest possible. While our unemployment average is 11.2% in the Eurozone and reaches 25 to 26% in economies such as Spain and reaching 70% among the EU, we maintain an unemployment rate of 5.1%, which is even below pre-crisis levels. But this doesn't make us careless and complacent. We are fully aware that the tricky aspect of the global economy is unpredictability, and you can almost never be sure where the greatest challenges and threats will emerge next. That is why we closely follow everything that's going on in neighboring economies and our partner economies. We wish them success, and we are honestly willing to assist them as good partners. Because any kind of economic mishap in the Eurozone, for instance, is bound to have painful ramifications for us. The Eurozone is our major sales market. Should it shrink, our own production will immediately decrease. Therefore, our interest is in seeing the Eurozone survive and our main partner economies getting back on track. We need Europe's leading economies, such as Germany, France and Britain, to be in good shape. This is something we'll always keep an eye on, and this will be a primary topic for discussion at the Vladivostok APEC summit. Well, we wish you all the very best. As President Vladimir Putin, thank you for talking to RT. Thank you very much.